I'm the service learning coordinator on campus. I'm a really someone who listen to me in your classes. And this is Beth Carroll. Um, she's an attorney, a local attorney, who's uh, an expert in the subject that we're going to be talking about. Um, I, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to say that I'm going to say and then give you a brief introduction to the series. So my name is Kimberly Tate. And welcome to our conversations on social issues. We host this week of conversation because we believe that it is our charge to provide open access um, and freedom of ideas. And we see this series as an extension of that. So while none of us will agree with everything we find ourselves or our databases or maybe even what we hear today, um, we want everyone to have the ability and option to listen to different perspectives and create your own opinion. So all points of view are welcome, and I ask that we have a lively and respectful discussion. So we have faculty, staff, community members, and students host this session. And if you are passionate about a topic, it can be on almost anything, come talk to either Kelly or myself. Kelly, wave your hand. Kelly or myself, and we'll help you get set up. Yeah, we love to have students participating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really a great draw that you can share what you're really passionate about with your peers and just get some more, get some good public speaking experience. And it's a nice day to learn your record. So at the end of this discussion, I'm going to ask everyone to fill out a short survey that will be coming around in about 55, 57 minutes. And it's really brief. We just want to know what we can do to improve this, what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can make this a more interesting and fun and relevant experience for you all. So next week, our conversation will be called Look Ma, I'm Using My Hands, The Cultural Appropriation of ASL American Sign Language. And Katie Roberts will be hosting that. She's an ASL instructor here. And there will be an ASL interpreter present. So today, join me in welcoming Patty Gorman, a service learning coordinator here at Seattle Central College, and Beth Carroll, an attorney at law with the firm Harold, Marshall, Dapp, and Lily, almost, and as they lead us in a session about forced arbitration. So, let's take them. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. I want to just um, just make an introductory, a few introductory remarks because I want to, um, if after you've heard these remarks, you're interested in uh, being on the email list for the organization that um, created this whole program, the Alliance for Justice, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, so if you're interested, if you hear uh, my opening remarks, um, excuse me, I'll tell you about the Alliance, um, then I'll pass this around and you can sign up. So it's just to, uh, you don't have to, it's not a sign-in sheet that everybody has to be on, it's if you want to be on the AFJ's email list. So the Alliance for Justice is a national association of over 100 organizations representing a broad array of groups. Um, committed to progressive values and the creation of equitable, just, and free society. Through their justice programs, they lead the progressive community in the fight for a fair judiciary, and uh, through their advocacy programs, they help nonprofits and foundations realize their advocacy potential. And one of their big things that I always read about in their uh, emails is. Um, their um, court watch. They're very concerned that we have, you know, they're concerned about our judiciary, and right now they're particularly concerned about all the vacant um, U.S. court ju judgeships that, well, that are vacant. <laughs> so, if you're interested in be, uh, being on their mailing list, just sign this and just pass it around the room. Um, did you want to sing it? Or should I just read that? So, yeah. okay. so the intro, we're going to show a video, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, so what I'd like to say before you see the video is that when you sign up for a cell phone, an online service like Instagram or Netflix, or even a new job, you are frequently signing away the right to go before an impartial judge or jury if you're harmed. So you just say, I don't, I'm, I'm giving up my rights to go to court if I feel that I've been harmed in some way. Forced arbitration clauses hidden in the fine print of these um, uh, contracts that you're actually compelled to sign if you want the service. Um, they send, uh, excuse me, forced arbitration clauses hidden in the fine print send you to a decision maker picked by the company that wronged you. If you're unhappy with the result, you can't even appeal the decision. Forced arbitration helps companies avoid being held accountable 
in a court of law when they violate anti-discrimination, consumer protection, and public health laws. So they violate laws that we have on the books that are supposed to protect our rights, but they are allowed to go off scot-free, and Beth will give you more information about that after the video. The video you are about to see tells the story of three everyday people who found themselves trapped in a system that favors large and powerful companies at the expense of hardworking Americans. It urges all of us to take a stand to stop forced arbitration and reclaim our rights. And on that um, eight and a half by 11 handout that you have on the back side at the very bottom, um, it tells you what you can do if you decide you want to take some action. So, all right, have a good time.
hold out the promise of safeguarding everyone, regardless of wealth and power. But that fundamental promise of equal justice under law is facing a severe threat. Buried in everyday agreements for products, services, and jobs is fine print saying when you are harmed, you can't go before an impartial jury or judge. Instead, these forced arbitration clauses send you to a decision maker picked by the company that wronged you. Not surprisingly, one study found that arbitrators rule for companies over consumers 94% of the time. And you're stuck with their decision because there's no appeal. It's a rigged system that helps companies evade responsibility for violating anti-discrimination, consumer protection, and public health laws. Nicole Mitchell found that out when her status as a reserve officer at the Air Force resulted in the loss of her job. And she discovered any hope of justice was lost in the fine print. At age 17, Nicole Mitchell joined the Air Force Reserve. I'm over 20 years now in the military. Today, she's a highly decorated officer and member of the elite Hurricane Hunters. Got 11 miles to turn down. Okay, While I was going to school for the military, doing weather, I was also in communications in college, planning to work in television. Next thing I knew, I was working at the Weather Channel. But also more this After time. just a few months, I was contributing to the main show. And that's where I stayed for most of the rest of my career. She was well liked by both staff and viewers, receiving consistently high ratings. With the military, occasionally there'd be a, a schedule conflict or things of that nature, but all things that we were able to work out. In 2008, the Weather Channel was purchased by NBC Universal. The new management was unhappy with Nicole taking time off for her military service. In August of 2010, I started my two weeks of military duty. When I got back uh, a couple days later, I was pulled into my manager's office. I never thought it would get to the point that I would lose my job. I want to thank you for watching Day Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, I actually think this is my last show here at the Weather Channel. So thanks for joining me for all days here. But coming up, we will have more on... So I really kind of got blindsided. Nicole is one of thousands of National Guard and Reserve members who believe they lost a job or have not been hired because they're on call to fight for their country. It's the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights it means they can't demote you or penalize because of that time off that you're taking. Even though her firing may have violated federal law that protects service members, Nicole was bound by the forced arbitration clause in the employment contract she had been required to sign. Everything was filed as confidential. To have cases like this kind of hidden and, and where someone can't even see what happened. The whole process is different in many levels. After everything, the arbitrator ruled without us even having a hearing on my issue. The arbitrator, I never even met this person who made this unilateral decision that we can never appeal. You've given up your right to go to a court. You've given up your right to a jury. You've given up your right to have whatever result become public. You've given up the right to an appeal. The first arbitration clauses are really a way the companies basically opt out of the basic laws that run the country. I really don't think this is what people want their justice system to be like. Denny is a wife, mother, and college graduate with a degree in cellular biology and physiology. Denny decided to return to school to become a surgical technician. When I was in college, I had medical programs for surgical technologists and one of the representatives she was really excited with the fact that I already had a degree she told me I would have absolutely no problem getting a job I was a shoe-in. Debbie began to realize that Lamson College part of the Delta Career Educational Corporation bore little resemblance to its claims. Lamson was letting all these scores of people in and just passing them along just to get their federal loan money. The business model of, uh, of the for-profit school industry is to market to you aggressively, to get you to sign up, to then get you to take out loans to pay your tuition to the school, and then to cash those loan checks. And when they were pumped out into the hospitals, they were failing because they weren't qualified. After graduation, Debbie couldn't even get an interview in any of the local hospitals. 
I, I would have been a great scrub. I just couldn't get an interview because they had ruined, literally ruined the market in our local area. I was very depressed. I was very depressed. Debbie and her fellow students were outraged. When they tried to hold Lampson accountable, they learned they had signed contracts that included a forced arbitration clause. Even at that point, to be honest with you, I didn't understand the ramifications of what it meant. You're stepping into something that is somewhere between um, an uphill slog for you and a flat out rigged game. And a lot of times arbitration clauses are written in a way that no one would understand. I worked on a case, the first sentence of the forced arbitration clause was 256 words. We sued them for, for fraud and breach of contract, you know, because, you know, they promised us all kinds of things. The case was forced into arbitration where it would be decided by an arbitrator, not by a judge or a jury. The founders would have been appalled. They said there should be a, a, a right to a, a trial by jury. I think they would be completely shocked. We had two Delta employees that worked in admissions department and they both said what the students are saying is in fact true. The judgment was given on May 1st, 2013. My attorney, he says, I received the decision from the arbitrator on your case. I wish I could say I had good news, but it actually could not really be any worse. The arbitrator denied all of your claims and also awarded Delta their attorney fees and costs. I felt like the air had been sucked out of my lungs. I literally walked around my house for a month and I didn't call anyone, not even my own mother. <laughs> we were made to pay 700000 in legal fees for their legal team. They hired two law firms, law firms with a multitude of lawyers. We ultimately got it reduced to 362000 which <laughs> doesn't really matter. I feel angry. I feel hurt. These arbitrators are in the back pockets of these corporations, and they're not going to side against the corporation because they know that I'll never sue somebody again but the corporation definitely will get sued again. What happens is that the corporation that's cheated you um, picks the company that's going to pick the arbitrator. So essentially you have a corporate tribunal in which the person who's going to decide the, the case has really been essentially picked by the other side. The problem with arbitration is it's a system that's designed by the repeat player. The arbitrator has an incentive, right? The arbitrator only gets hired if if the people who are selecting uh, the forum want them to be hired. And so there have been examples where arbitrators have been blacklisted simply because they rule for consumers. Our country was, was founded that everybody had equal rights before the law. And that's, that's an, clearly not the case today with forced binding arbitration. People like Nicole Mitchell and Debbie Brenner have learned the hard way that the system is stacked against them. But it didn't get this way by accident. Many companies wanted to use forced arbitration provisions to avoid court for a long time, but they needed help to do it. And they got it from the United States Supreme Court. In one key case, the owners of a neighborhood restaurant in Oakland, California, discovered that when small business goes up against big business, fairness is clearly not on the menu. Good afternoon, Italian Colors. Italian Colors in Oakland, California, is the quintessential neighborhood restaurant, with a loyal following of customers attracted to the good food and friendly atmosphere. Italian Colors is my American dream. I love what I do. I'm very passionate about it. I've been cooking now for 41 years. I don't know how to describe that. It's just, it's, it's wonderful. While business was good, profit margins were slim, okay. in part due to the fees charged by credit card companies. This started, um, I guess it's probably been 12, over 12 years ago now. I was complaining about the new charges I was noticing on American Express. What Alan and a lot of other merchants upset, are upset by are these swipe fees. These swipe fees um, are fees that the credit card companies charge on every purchase in Alan's restaurant. And it eats into your profits. What it means is an annual uh, debit of between fifty-three and $60,000 that goes to the credit card processes. 
And that's quite a big chunk. Third, fourth largest. Expense. Alan talked to Ed Zussman, a regular customer and San Francisco attorney, about the excessive and unfair fees the restaurant was required to pay for the right to use American Express cards. He goes, let me look into it and see what we can do. And then uh, he looked into it and asked if we wanted to file a suit. And I said, absolutely. I think your customers would be, he said to me, if it'll help other people and there's a chance that we can get these charges reduced, that we have to pay American Express, um, I'm up for it. But Alan and Steve then learned that a forced arbitration clause buried in the fine print meant that American Express could not be held accountable in a court of law. They sent a bulk mailer out that looked like a credit card application. And I guess the fine print in there was saying that it was now, if you had any discrepancies with American Express, you had to go through arbitration. And to this day, I think Alan still doesn't have any idea what that paper said, if he got it, when he got it, where it is, if he did get it. For years, federal laws have protected consumers and small businesses against unfair practices by powerful corporations. These credit card companies have incredible market power. They have really the ability to dictate to small businesses like our, our client, Italian Colors Restaurant, what the terms of their contracts are going to be. And the merchant really has very little choice. The bottom line is it's not just about the credit card fees. Everyone needs to make money one way or the other. It was about the way they went about slipping in the arbitration only clause. Very sick, Ben. Thank you. Italian Colors joined with other small businesses to seek justice. Okay. It's like, okay, I'm not going to back down from it. I felt bullied. And uh, that makes me want to stand up for myself more rather than cowering in a corner. They couldn't believe their right to their day in court could be taken away. So they fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 2013, the United States Supreme Court ruled on the case of Italian Colors versus American Express. Uh, Supreme Court, they ruled against us and, and shot us down. They ruled in, in favor of big business. The Supreme Court ruled the forced arbitration clause stood even where it meant violations of important federal laws would go unpunished, continuing a trend of expanding corporate rights. But in the Italian Colors case, Justice Elena Kagan wrote this extremely strong, powerful, eloquent dissent. And what she did was she really set out that what the majority had done was a betrayal. What Justice Kagan was saying is the Supreme Court is not even hiding what it's doing anymore. It is up front that it is telling all of you that if you enter into a contract with fine print and it says that you have to go to arbitration and that means you can't bring your claim anywhere, even if it's guaranteed by law that you should be able to bring the claim, too darn bad. It was basically giving big corporations a get out of jail free card as long as what they do is small enough. We prefer to protect a large business than to let a small business have its day in court. I mean, that time color was not even allowed to have its day in court. It took the wind out of a sale. I was uh, pretty upset at Scalia for his writing. I hadn't read it yet, but right away that night, we were uh, so angry we put a Scalia Manhattan on the menu as a cocktail special, and we wrote underneath it extra bitter and a little hard to swallow. The Supreme Court has shown that not only do they not care about this problem, not only does the Supreme Court not want to fix this problem, but the Supreme Court has actually created the problem. It was essentially a green light to corporations to write these clauses into their contracts. I got a lot of uh, law professors from Cal came in and you know they wanted to bring their students in and say, this is the restaurant, this is David that took on Goliath. Would I do it again with the amount of effort and, and energy you put into it? I think I would say yes, I would. The story is told by Alan Carlson, Heavy Brenner, and Nicole Mitchell. Describe a system that favors large and powerful companies at the expense of hardworking Americans. But the stories they tell aren't just about them. They're also about you and me. If you live in the modern world, you've almost certainly lost your rights in the fine print many times, whether you know it or not. Every day, I hear from my students and others who fear that our democratic values are at risk as the powerful get stronger. Alan, Debbie, and Nicole are fighting back, and I sense a growing willingness to join that fight. General Mills adopted an arbitration clause that was really unfair, and they had all sorts of exotic, weird provisions in it. So one of them was if a kid goes and likes General Mills on Facebook, they now supposedly agreed to force arbitration that they can't go to court or something like this. 
as this got out, and there were some media stories about it, tons of consumers became angry and started putting things up on their Facebook pages and tweeting about it. And within a week, the company couldn't stand the pressure and backed away from the forced arbitration clause. What I found with bringing my case forward is so many guard and reservists saying, we went through the same thing. And I plan on fighting this arbitration um, even after this is done. Most Americans don't know about it, but certainly don't agree with it. And I think that that's going to result in more and more people reacting against it. More and more and more Americans are going to be hurt, and they're going to be finding out what this is all about, and um, waking up. It's up to legislation, and that in turn means that it's up to the people. It's up to all of us, and this is a fight we can win. The tide is starting to shift. Individuals are beginning to speak out. Consumer protection agencies are investigating. Congress is considering legislation. We have the power as consumers and the obligation as Americans to change things. Join our campaign. Spread the word to family and friends. Sign petitions. Get on Twitter and Facebook. Tell public officials forced arbitration violates our core democratic principles. What's been lost in the fine print can once again be found with strong voices, our voices. I urge you to use yours. I'm Robert Reich. Thank you for watching. Appeal that decision. 
Um, and what forced arbitration does is it takes away all of those rights, many of which are actually embedded in the Constitution. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. yeah could you explain how this relates to like cell phone contracts and like checking out those terms and condition boxes for various websites? Yeah, I would say that uh, I'm not aware of any wireless provider today, uh, any cell phone provider that does not have a mandatory arbitration clause and a class action waiver. So when you buy your cell phone, um, you don't have to sign anything, right? As soon as the way the, the, way the contract works, <coughs> the terms and conditions, as soon as you uh, accept those terms and conditions by making your payment and using your phone, you're bound to those, and if you look at them, they're usually on the website, you can almost always find them on the website, you'll see that AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, all of them say, if you have a dispute with them, uh, you have to go to arbitration, um, and uh, you'll be, you know, your, the, the claim will be governed by the rules of typically either the American Arbitration Association or some other private organization where all they do is arbitrate claims privately for big companies. And so the same with whenever you, um, you know, you, you sign up for new software, a new operating system, when you do what's called a click wrap agreement, you know, you just want to get through it and so you just scroll down and you say yes, yes, yes. Chances are there's an arbitration clause uh, in there where you've just agreed without even knowing it uh, that you'll never be able to sue that company in court. And if you try, they will, they will immediately ask to have that case transferred uh, to arbitration, then it's confidential, no one will know the outcome, um, and you'll be stuck in a tribunal, perhaps just without, without even a hearing. That's very typical, very small consumer claims. There isn't even a hearing. You don't even meet the arbitrator, you don't get to say anything to the arb arbitrator, it's submitted on papers. That's just not what you know, the Founding Fathers meant um, when they talked about the Seventh Amendment right uh, to trial that we're all supposed to have. Any others? Yeah. Is that changing with privacy issues? Like, if they have a privacy policy and they tell you that's their privacy policy, but then you, it turns out they sell your information to somebody, a third party, um, can you still not speak to them? It's interesting. Um, I'm in the target uh, privacy litigation. Uh, my firm does some of that work as well. When we looked into their um, their website terms and conditions and some of their other terms and conditions, they did not have an arbitration clause, but they could have. Uh, there's no reason why uh, they couldn't have bound people to arbitration as well. But it, it raises sort of the point as to how far can it go. And the General Mills example is a good one. Uh, we've been waiting for a long time for Dairy Gold to put an arbitration clause on the milk bottle, right? You know, so that, or the, you know, whatever. So that when you're, you're sitting there eating your cereal in the morning and you look at the milk carton, uh, because you read the milk carton, right, they're going to say that you've agreed to buy an arbitration. And we really kind of thought that was a joke. Um, and then General Mills, right, almost went that far. Uh, but it was interesting to see uh, the backlash against that, but that was really going too far. Simply liking General Mills on a, on a Facebook page, something on the internet, that that was not going to, you know, the public did not think that was enough um, to have people waive their right uh, to a jury trial. So there really are very few limits to what they can say you have to arbitrate. Um, there are a few lim limits, and Congress has sort of nibbled around the edges at this stuff. Um, there's been a, uh, an Arbitration Fairness Act that has been uh, introduced for the last five years, if not longer. Um, it rarely gets out of committee. Sometimes it gets a little bit of attention, but it's been shot down. But the goal has been to eliminate uh, mandatory arbitration clauses um, in employment agreements, nursing homes. That's a really egregious situation where when people are putting their, their parents and loved ones into a nursing home, they're suddenly signing their rights away to a jury trial so that if the nursing home either you know, neglects, abuses, or perhaps even kills their loved one, they can't go to court like you normally would with a personal injury suit. They have to go to arbitration. It, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and so uh, that was one of the areas where they were hoping to eliminate that. 
Uh, so there have been some inroads there. Uh, the first one is uh, military contractors. President Obama actually just issued an, an executive order, and there are now some limits on uh, when private contractors can put arbitration clauses into their employment agreements, which is good. There's a new agency that was formed, um, I think it was four years ago now, maybe longer, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They've been doing a, a you know, many year long study of arbitration in, in the consumer finance industry, so credit cards, mortgages, um, all sorts of you know, bank accounts, all of that to see whether it's fair, to see whether people even know that they are signing arbitration clauses, and then to see what the outcome is when people go to arbitration. Is it a fair system or not? We're expecting them to issue a report here anytime. They have the power, Congress gave them the power under the Dodd-Frank Act to prohibit arbitration clauses in the consumer financial industry, and that's what we expect them to do. Um, and so that will be a big deal when and if they do that, but then that will trigger litigation over whether they have the power to do that or whether it was the right thing to do. And so we'll see how long it takes to implement that. Um, one of the other areas where there's been a little bit of limitation is the Department of Defense just uh, issued some regulations that are out for public comment uh, that will limit the ability, will actually will prohibit uh, arbitration clauses in financial, um, in, in any sort of dealings with, uh, with veterans having to do with consumer finance products. So again, credit cards, uh, payday loans, all that stuff that, that sort of congregates around bases and really takes advantage of uh, our active military and our veterans. And so that's pretty exciting to see that. That's gonna sort of protect a large group of people. But the telecommunications industry and um, electronics industry, it's all still sort of fair game. I think there was a question over, yeah. Yeah, uh, right yeah. it seems that like arbitration has turned to a, a bit of a chimera. Where did it initially start? Because like all the, like all laws kind of have like all like the stars in their eyes about how they wanted it to be, but then it's been warped. So where did it start? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it started with the, with the Federal Arbitration Act, and it started with um, a desire to provide uh, a more efficient, cost-effective way for businesses to resolve their disputes. It's not unusual in a business-to-business -business dispute, right? So, you know, Staples versus AT&T or whatever, to want to arbitrate uh, their case um, because it might be highly technical or it might, be, um, it might be something they don't want in public. And so when you have two companies that agree to arbitrate and they choose, you know, a three-arbitrator panel, that can make a lot of sense, right? Because it's faster, there might be less discovery. So there are, there are times when arbitration is, is a good idea. And that's really what was going on when they passed the Federal Arbitration Act a long time ago. It's been warped in recent years, and it really um, started to a certain extent, um, well, it really, I guess, sort of hit the high water mark with the, the AT&T versus Concepcion case, right? where there had been um, sort of a move of corporations to try and push consumer class actions into arbitration and to also prohibit them. And the states had really uh, limited that to a large degree, and many of the federal appellate courts had limited uh, the, co the corporation's ability to do that. In the Concepcion case, um, unfortunately, you know, what the Supreme Court said is that the Federal Arbitration Act trumps basically state law. So it's a preemption issue, um, saying that the federal law actually uh, uh, trumps, it preempts the state's ability to, uh, to regulate those issues. And that's kind of a complicated topic, but that's kind of, kind of what happened. And it's not the way it had to go, because there are, there, there's always an ability for the states to regulate common law, like breach of contract, right, and misrepresentation. Those are our state law claims that have nothing to do uh, with the federal courts. And why shouldn't the courts be able to um, enforce those laws, regardless of this federal law uh, that was enacted a long time ago? So with the fact that businesses can essentially treat people as corporations or vice versa, uh, could it be with a, a part of citizens like United, where all of a sudden corporations are now evil? And then, but purely because they can now interact with people as a corporate, at a corporation level, where people are really not that. 
Yeah. Um, I don't think those, those issues are directly related, um, but you raise a good point, which is really that our current Supreme Court is heavily favored towards corporations, um, and it's going to find a way to give them status that, that they've never had before. So, you know, the one thing that I add to, um, let me just say one thing first, one thing that I add to the list of things you can do is, uh, is vote. Um, and, you know, I'm a partisan here. I believe strongly that many of the 5-4 decisions that have been issued by our current United States Supreme Court are politically driven, and they are consistent with what the uh, conservative chamber of commerce it would like them to do, and is, has really, really spent a lot of money convincing them that they should do. And if you think that our court system is not um, influenced by politics or ideology, I wish that that were true, but it's not. And so it is really the case that one of the most important things you can do uh, is vote, uh, because your your votes uh, determine. Uh, you know, who is representing us, uh, you know, in Washington, and that dictates to a certain extent, although we're a very small population, but dictates to a certain extent who ends up uh, on our state Supreme Court, so. And, and vote, I'm sorry, just one quick thing. And voting um, locally, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I used to look at, oh, well, presidential election, that's usually when I go out and get involved in the campaigns, but the local level is very important because a lot of the people who, uh, say, judge, who win judgeships on the, the ones that are elected. You know, those people move up and, um, you know, eventually they could be on the Supreme Court. That, that, that's right. So it's not just the president, but your local uh, elections as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I teach here and I have a lot of international students in my class. <coughs> a lot of them are here. How does this affect them, like, when they're here and signing contracts for products? And then uh, in their own home countries, they have their own policies as well. Well, I guess I would say that so long as they're here um, and they've bought the product here, if they want to challenge something that happened, they're going to be governed by uh, what's in that contract with the company that they signed here. Yeah. Um, you'll, you'll find that, I mean, and I think this is interesting, a lot of the companies have different terms and conditions for different companies, not surprisingly, and they will have different versions of the arbitration clause, depending on what they think is enforceable in whatever country uh, you know the consumer is from, uh, and so uh, in, in the U.S., you know the companies have started to make them more what what appears to be consumer friendly. They say they'll pay most of the costs, right? They will, you know, they'll do certain things to make it easier to participate in the arbitration. You don't find any of those provisions in in the overseas arbitration clauses because they don't they don't have. Any other questions? Yeah. So don't the people like from the United States want to like run the government and the government and make their own decisions? Like, uh, so who, who would overthrow it? Who would do that? The people of the United States. Well, so you know, um, there's a couple ways that, that we can do that. One is, right, the agency that was created through, through Congress, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, they have the ability to prohibit arbitration clauses. So that's one way. Um, that by voting, you've got a Congress that had the nerve to enforce a statute that gave an agency that, that power. But in terms of direct overthrow, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. No, there are petitions going around, but of course the petitions are, you know, to put uh, pressure on those folks in, in power. If you look at the Alliance for Justice website, they've got a petition on there that, that you can sign that supports the, uh, you know, the Arbitration Fairness Act, um, and just generally will keep you in loop with, with what's going on at, at the national level. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll see. They've got, they've got an inability to do much of anything right now uh, in Washington. So trying to pass something like this is difficult. So, uh, yeah. Has anyone tried to think up a constitutional <coughs> amendment that would guarantee uh, U.S. citizens a right to use the courts? We have a constitutional right to a jury trial. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? That, that we would even need to think about that. Um, I, it, it's, there's something really wrong that we have a, a, a constitutional right that is being ignored. Um, so, so not yet. There, there are a couple of um, public uh, nonprofit organizations out there pushing for some uh, constitutional amendments, and one of them is on, the, uh, uh, is, is on your issue with regard to American United. 
Let's go you first. Okay, well then, so what, how does the court explain away that right when they are um, giving these decisions to the companies? How do they say that it does not violate the consumer's right to a jury trial? They say that um, you have uh, voluntarily waived it. Waived it, okay. Yep. So, follow up, so I'm assuming like um, landline uh, phone contracts have a similar clause like arbitration. So it's expected that people are supposed to have a phone, right, for communication. Like you're not going to be in a log cabin. Like you, it's expected there's so many things that have to do with your own welfare that depend on a phone, even like the police trying to get you, you to know where you are, calling 911, mm -hmm. all of those things. So if you're expected to have a phone, I mean, how how can how can you get out of these arbitration laws? It's like you have to have a phone. I mean, maybe you don't have to have a cell phone, but you have to have some sort of phone. And if they all have the contract, it, it just it isn't as simple as that you're just forced to sign away your rights. Or is there some way that the consumer can say, you know, I opt out or I protest or I don't know. This, okay. I, and I'm, we're not talking about voting and no, all that. No, you're exactly no, you're exactly right. Some of the companies, because of the way some of the legal decisions have come down, have started to add in an opt-out provision. So within 30 days of you, you know, agreeing to the terms and conditions, buying your phone, you have to send in an opt-out. You might have seen this when. Um, the same sort of thing is when Facebook changed its terms and conditions, right? If they let, they let you know, then you, you, you have the ability to opt out of them, right? Um, and so, so that means you need to look carefully at the terms and conditions, see if there's an opt out, and then exercise it. What, what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, one of the things that they studied was how many consumers ever opt out when they're given the chance, and it's very, very few because the biggest problem with these clauses is they're, they're on your screen and you're just trying to get through the screen to check the box so you can do whatever you need to do or you want to use your phone. So, and, and the court has said, that's okay. It's okay that it's hard to find them. It's okay you have to click through 10 screens. But if you click through 10 screens, there might be an opt-out. So, so is, it, is the opt-out typically at when they change their terms and conditions? It should be. Not initially. Well, no, it should be both. If you're if you're a new customer, right, then and they have an opt out in their provisions, which not all of them do, you'll be, you'll be provided it there. And then if they change it to add an arbitration clause, they'll probably have the opportunity to opt it opt out at that point if they have an opt out. But it's a very small number of companies that have the opt out, but some of them do. Yeah, some of them do. Yeah. yeah my father was actually part of AT&T when they adopted their first arbitration clause, and they, I was wondering about the fact that the major companies you had all listed up there were all either telecom uh, in, in, uh, web, web companies and all and uh, and or uh, information companies. Between all three, do you think the federal government has a vested interest to ensure that the arbitration clause continues due to the fact that they, we now know that they are so uh, ubiquitous and violating our private rights that essentially that could be companies are protected in being agents of the company agents of the federal government. So, when you say federal government, who do you mean? Uh, NSA, FBI, so your alphabet soup. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what their vested what their vested interest is. I know that those groups are not interested in vindicating consumer rights. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so that that goes without saying. You have consumer rights. Um, yes. Every so often, I'll get uh, a letter in the mail, something not for the change in terms of opt-out, but something that says, oh, you're part of a class action suit with this company or that company, and, and now you have the dollar in the cents coming mm -hmm. to you if you sign this and this and whatever. So there are some class action suits going on. Obviously, if all of you is a dollar in the cent, the terms are There are still class actions. I mean, that's most of my practice. Um, I'll tell you, I haven't had any settlements that have paid out a dollar eighty-three. Um, you know, you know, there are 
Some of my class actions, we just did a wage and hour class action on behalf of home health care workers. We have people who weren't paid overtime for you know as long as 10 years. Some of them are getting 10, 12, 13 thousand dollars. Those are the cases that we do. But you're right, there are still some class actions, and some of them have really uh, small payouts that don't don't make it worth it. Um, but the problem is that company, even though it's a dollar 83 per per you know per class member, and um, there might be 10 million uh, class members, and it might be the amount of money that they made off of whatever they were doing was 30 or 40 million dollars. So the question is whether class actions deter bad conduct. I, I tend to think that they do. So that's part of the goal of, of doing class actions. Uh, yeah. Um, does this have the same effect on minors as it does adults? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I would say that there would be a, an enforceability defense on behalf of a minor uh, as to whether or not you are legally capable of uh, funding contracts. So I think there would, there would be a defense there. Yeah. Have you seen any cases of government agencies or uh, public um, entities using it as For example, colleges. Oh, colleges for sure. Especially state the for-profits. Especially, no. State one last thing, you've got a brochure from Public Justice. So the guy on, one of the guys on there, Paul Bland, he's the executive director. He's been fighting mandatory arbitration for the last 10 years. I'm on their board. Take a look at it. Um, there are student memberships. It's a really great organization that, that um, you know, does a lot to protect consumer rights, environmental rights, uh, eliminate court secrecy. We've actually got a bullying project. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look at it if you're interested in that. Great, got a great website that has everything on it. We'd love to have you as a member. Um, Alliance for Justice, same thing. Look at their website. They're doing a ton, ton of important work, especially in terms of uh, trying to get more women and minorities to apply for and be appointed to the bench. Right? That's a that's a big goal.